Welcome back, Shaloners. You know what we're going to talk about today? Garbage fires. Yes, obviously, Jake Paul and Tana Mojo's ridiculous garbage wedding between two garbage people. I'm going to say up front, I know very little about these people, and that is by choice, okay? I have studiously avoided diving into their sort of cesspool careers and cloud and publicity stunts. But today, I'm going to pull on my emotional hip boots and we're going to wade right on in because what I want to do is not just crap all over them. I do and I will. But I want to talk about what we can learn from this car crash of a, of a situation. Namely, why fast relationships are bad relationships and why when something's moving too fast, it's the surest sign that it's toxic right? But first, just want to remind you guys, if you have a love question and you want to talk to me privately about any little thing one-on-one, -on -one, find me on the Instant Go app. My username is ShallonXO and click chat to get connected. And follow me on Instagram at ShallonXO where I let you guys weigh in on the next video topic. And be sure to listen to my new podcast, Girl on Top, where I answer the best questions you guys submitted over the course of the week. Kind of like a Dear Abby thing, but cooler because Abby never swore and I do. <laughs> So Jake and Tana. Now, I'm going to be mispronouncing Tana's name throughout this entire video because, again, I don't know or care who she is. Like, everything I've heard about her, I have, number one, learned against my will. And number two, it has always been very negative. It's not like Tana Mojo, like, finds a new cure for type 1 diabetes. It's like she leaves YouTube fans out in the sun for six hours and charges them $200 and everyone gets sun poisoning and has to go home at TanaCon. So, Okay. The Paul brothers, Logan Paul will kill someone one day. He will, if he hasn't already. I'm being, and I'm being perfectly serious. That man is a psychopath and he is a textbook, unapologetic psychopath. And he won't just kill someone. He'll like torture them and kill them. Like we'll find a prostitute from Tijuana tied up in his basement at some point. Like he is a very frightening person to me. And it's even more frightening that people are following him. And I mean literally following him. I was at the Orange County Fair last year, my hometown, and I was on like the little people mover thing that goes across, if you've been, you know, and I see this person with like neon yellow hair, just a very unrealistic shade of blonde, walking kind of like a hitman or a gorilla, like really fast. And this swarm of children, not teenagers, children trailing after him. It was fucking Logan Paul. And I was like, what kind of man wants to be this Pied Piper for children? But like, I also get why like 11 year old boys love him. Cause he's like, no parents, no rules, frosting for dinner, shooting who I don't like. Woo! So like, I get why that's appealing to a child, but it's worrisome that that's how he lives his life all the time. You, do you know what I mean? Like, and he's living his life like that, irredemptive of nothing. It's not like, but here's a lesson how to get along with your parents. And here's how to like grow up and make a lot of money. It's just like, I'm going to drive through traffic with a blindfold on. I'm going to mock people who committed suicide in Japan. And you're probably thinking, all right, well, he's not the one who got married. Jake got married. I believe in nature over nurture, sweetheart. And I don't think Jake Paul is too far from that tree, you know? I don't know that he's going to kill someone. He'll probably help hide the body. You know, they'll probably like try to dig a grave and be like, this is hard. Can't we just like task grab at this? I'm so excited for them to end up in prison. I'm so excited. But that's not what we're here to talk about, kind of. We're going to talk about the marriage between Tana and Jake. It is, oh, I mean, on one hand, I'm so disgusted with being alive in 2019 where like women's rights are being scaled back. People think it's okay to keep immigrants in cages at the border, separated from their children until they die. Great. What a time to be alive. But I'm also thankful that I got to witness the garbage fire that was Tana and Jake's hideous marriage. It just took place in Las Vegas at a sugar factory. Ugh. Talk about curing diabetes. Um, Tana had her hair in like, you know, the the half ponytail thing secured by just like a regular black Rite Aid hair tie. You know, she didn't even like take a strand and wrap it around. And she's wearing like little glasses and this cheap chintzy Betsy Johnson fucking chapter eight bankruptcy clearance rack dress. But look, Jake looks like any zitty twerp. He's like an overgrown Dennis the Menace, like a giant sentient Bart Simpson. So of course these two found each other and they referred to their wedding as clout instead of matrimony. 
I'm all for people leveling up. I'm all for people hustling and making their money. What do I care? It doesn't cost me anything. It's no skin off my back. There's room at the table for all of us YouTubers. But this is just so, oh, they hired an Oprah impersonator for their wedding. Why? For what possible reason? I think they had a Bruno Mars impersonator. They sat on thrones. She just, ah, uh, the whole thing was so ratty. It was so ratty and trashy. But you know what? There we go. And I think it's interesting that they found each other because, you know, water seeks a similar low level, as they say. Like, like attracts like. And these two seem real similar. And it's annoying to me that they've gone through with this. And then they'll do these stunts. And then they'll be like, what? It's just entertainment. Of course it was fake. Like, how sad that you can't even be interesting in your own life. Like, nothing you would authentically do is interesting. So you have to come up with these larger, larger, larger schemes. It reminds me of porn. Porn started out as like a booby. First it was like an ankle and then it was like a, a bosom and then it was like a fanny. And now it's like a pregnant woman like shooting things from just, it's gone beyond. And it's like, that's what happens. Like people need more, 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 more. So I'm like, girl, guy, you're 21, 22. What is your five year plan? What is it gonna be? Like what's next? You like, well, she already did fake a pregnancy. She told him that she was pregnant. He cried, likely not tears of happiness. And you know what? I cried with relief when I found out it was fake because I think we're all stocked up on people like that in this world. We're fine. We're fine. The Obamas can keep reproducing. Get, I mean, come on, Michelle. You got to have at least two more in the chamber there. Let, please, we need this. But the, the Paul brothers also never trust people with two first names. Logan Paul. Shallon Lester. Never mind. We're just, we're going to move on from that. So what can we learn from this? Besides just these two are garbage people and we'll be unhappy. And it's so frustrating that they're so rich. It's so frustrating. Just 5 million followers, 5 million. And she is, I mean, she is kind of funny. She's messy, but it's like, you could be funny and not messy. You could be funny and not like doing things for clout. Ugh. Anyway. So I got to thinking about fast relationships because a lot of the guys or a lot of the questions you guys submit to me when you're telling me now from the period of you're in the middle of a garbage fire, you're tracing back the history of a situation with this guy and it almost always starts the same way, fast. He just couldn't get enough of me and we were hanging out all the time and we slept together right away and blah, 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 blah. Sweep me off my feet. Psychologists actually study this. It's the swept away phenomenon and it it actually, they were studying it in terms of why women end up accidentally pregnant. Why like smart women who have thought about whether or not they want a baby and like they have condoms by the bed and blah, blah, blah. You know, they're not just like, I don't know. How does this work? Like they end up pregnant and it's because of the swept away phenomenon because we as women are conditioned in this fairy tale thing. Swept me off my feet. It's just, I got taken away. What that is, is a getaway car. You know, we want someone, a white knight, to ride in and save us from our own lives. Save me from the monotony of college. Save me from the drudgery of a nine to five. Save me from my family. Save me from my self-esteem. Save me. I learned a long time ago, no one is coming to fucking save you. I learned that after I was sexually assaulted in college. And I told people, and you know who did anything? Fucking no one. No one. Either they didn't believe me or they're like, I'm sorry that happened. No one encouraged me to call the police. No one encouraged me to file a civil suit. No one even encouraged me to go to the hospital. And that's when I realized no one was coming to save me. Man, woman, family member, police officer. I was going to have to save myself in this world. And it was the, it was the loneliest feeling. But on the other side of that loneliness, because I really leaned into it, on the other side of that was this feeling of incredible personal power, incredible personal power. Because I was like, I am not living for anyone. I'm not writing to please someone or to protect someone. I'm not following a path someone says I should. I'm not doing what the previous generation, I'm not doing what my friends are doing. You can all fuck off. I am pleasing me. And I didn't isolate myself and I wasn't bitter, but I was like, this is just the reality of what this is. And this is life. And it was a hard life lesson to learn, but I'm glad that I learned it because at the end of the day, nobody owes you shit. Life don't owe you shit, baby girl. It doesn't. And so whatever we achieve, we have to achieve for ourselves. 
So what does this have to do with dating, right? So going back to what the psychologist said, these women ended up pregnant because they wanted to be swept away. They didn't want to have to make the decision. Can we stop and put on a cat? I just need to go. I have to take my pill and blah, blah, blah. They wanted to just forget, forget about the problems. My bangs are, do they look square? Oh, that's the wallpaper this whole time. I thought my hair was like a right angle. Okay. They wanted to be taken away from what they were experiencing, either logistically, you know, I want to get out of this one horse town and I'm going to like rely on this like fast talking slick guy to like take me away. They want to get away from what's inside and it doesn't work and it ends up creating more problems, right? I mean, in this, in the cases they were studying, a baby and not a baby is a problem. It's a blessing, whatever. No, it's not. But like, that's, that's one more layer of complication. When had you just looked at the original problem, that original psychological itch that I always talk about, you could have just addressed that. But now, because you ran from it and ran into the arms of someone else, now he's the problem. And if we look at this in terms of a drug addict, it's like extremely clear. Have you guys ever watched Intervention? I feel like I talk about Intervention every single time I do this video. They should, they should sponsor me. But I find it fascinating because these people, it's always like, they came from a fairly good family, you know, like they had all this promise. They were so smart. They were so beautiful, blah, blah, blah. How'd they end up on meth? And it's always some trauma. There's always a thing that happened. Dad left in the middle of the night and wouldn't speak to me. I was raped in college. I went on two tours in Iraq and I had PTSD that I never got treated. And because they didn't just address those traumas and figure it out, and pull that splinter out and let it heal. They use alcohol or drugs or whatever to anesthetize themselves. Then those vices took on a life of their own. And we're like, yeah, no shit. You should just address the original issue and you would have ended up here. But why is it so opaque when it comes to guys? Why can we not see that? Well, because for one, alcohol doesn't talk back to you. Alcohol just sits there on the shelf. It's not like, I can love you. Come over, blow me. It's not whispering sweet nothings in your ear. It's not making promises to you. The addict is projecting all of that onto them. And I guess in a way, it's not so different with guys. You know, like when I look back on the times I feel bamboozled by men or in a toxic situation, like, yes, they were, they were lying to me and deceiving me, but I was lying to myself and I was lying for them. I was making excuses for them. I was even apologizing for them. Like, well, you know, I'm sure he's sorry. Oh, did, did, he, did he say he was sorry? No, he, he didn't. He didn't say, I'm sorry, I ghosted you. I'll never do that again. Here's what I've learned about myself since then. I have just filled in the blanks with my own desperation. And then, like alcohol or meth, he became his own problem. So now I not only had to deal with this, I still had to address the itch. Or not. You know, this is why people relapse on drugs and alcohol. They're not dealing with the itch. And we do the same thing with guys. We relapse into those toxic relationships. So what does this have to do with going fast? When a relationship is right, it's easy. You might have heard that before. And you're probably thinking, yeah, when it's fast, it's easy. We're spending all of our time together, blah, blah, blah. Look at that in terms of a different kind of dynamic. Look at that in terms of like a friendship. You would think it's weird if you met a girl at Pilates and then you were having sleepovers three times a week. You were blocking out all of your other friends. You were taking time off work. You were just like orienting your entire life around her. That would be weird, right? Look at it with a job. Yeah, you got hired to do this job and actually they want you to be CEO. That's weird. What does that mean? I don't know but something weird and bad because you, you can identify that that's not an appropriate trajectory, right? It's the same with love. And we tend to think it's like, no, it's gotta be like Bonnie and Clyde and us against the world. You know how to end it for Bonnie and Clyde? They were riddled with bullets and they were evil, evil people. It should never be like me and him against the world. The world's a lot of people and literally most of them don't give a fuck what you do. So stop acting like everyone's against us. We're just all going, you wouldn't care so much what people thought about you if you knew how seldom they did. So if you're in a relationship to like spite everyone else, you're really only hurting yourself. Because like I said, that boy is your meth. And you're just going to go down, 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 down that rabbit hole. Because one thing a manipulative person does, and this is what psychologists have found, is the trajectory of a toxic, like dangerously toxic relation. And I don't mean toxic, like run of the mill fuck boy, but I mean, kind of, you know, it's all on that spectrum. Idolization, 
deflation, discardment. He idolizes you. I need to spend all my time with you. I'm obsessed with you. I love you. Let's get married two months after we met, Tana. Okay. And then deflation. <sighs> You're so boring. You make me so fucking crazy. You're so stupid. I don't even want to be around you. Because then you go from big to small. And then you associate that happiness that you felt with him. Who's the only person that can make me feel that intense? Jake Paul. I'm sorry, Tuba Mongoloid or whatever her name is. Like, that's a toxic relationship. And then what the next thing is? Discardment. So Tater Tot is probably like, he made me feel like I was queen of the world, blah, blah, blah. And then Jake is going to pull that affection. If you read like BuzzFeed's account of the wedding, Jake was like super whateverish about it. Like not into it, not talking to anyone. And this is her wedding day. I mean, it's a fake wedding, so fuck her. But like, even it's just like a joint party you're hosting. I don't want to host a party with my boyfriend and have him be like skulking around in the corner, not talking to anyone. Like that's not good. So Tuba's probably like, oh my God, like what happened? And then Jake, the next phase of this is discardment. And I think we can all see this coming. So Tantalamogo is in for a very big fall because he has inflated her, the clout. He's told her like, I can get you more followers. We're going to make so much money. We're going to be like the king and queen of the internet, blah, 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 blah. And Tomato's like, oh my God, yes, this is going to happen for me. And now he's, he's going through the minimizing and she's going to associate that happiness with him and imprint on him and never be able to get over it. Right. And that's what happens when a relationship goes too fast. Cause all this happens really, really fast because you're going to see a shift in him that will come out of like nowhere. It's like, well, we were just, we were just spending all the time together and now he's not calling me back. What did I do? What did I do? Who do I need to be to get his love? Let me twist myself into a pretzel. So tampon's probably going through this also, you know, like what do I need to do to get his attention to be back in the light of him? You need to get rid of him, Mobo. You need to get rid of him. Mufasa, you can do better than this. It's difficult. So if you look back at your past toxic relationships, not only look at what he was doing, look at the pace. Because like I always say, there's two key things that are present in a healthy relationship when a guy really likes you. A regular pattern of communication, right? He's showing up when he says he will. He's texting you regularly. He's following up. He's scheduling the dates. And an escalation of that pattern. But pacing in an escalation is crucial. Because if you have a pattern with no escalation, that's basically friend zone. If you have escalation with no pattern, I mean, he wants to like spend our entire weekend together and it's our first Tinder date. He wants to go away with me. That's not good. That's not good. And you have to listen to your intuition because this is the thing with our intuition. We expect her to give us like a PowerPoint presentation of her reasoning. You know, that's not how it is. I go back to this example all the time. Like if you're walking your dog at night and it like walks by a hedge and it's like fur stands up and it's like, you're like, oh shit, there's something in there. You're not like, well, noodles, what do you have to say for yourself? Where's your like bullet pointed list of what's going wrong? Did you get it notarized? No, pussy. You're like, oh, noodles knows something, you know? And you, you accept that noodles has an intuition. Why don't we do that with ourselves? If you're getting the sense of like, this is moving too fast, or this is moving at irregular intervals, we'll spend three days together and then I don't hear from him for nine days. Pattern escalation. They have to walk hand in hand. And you don't need to know what a bad thing means. You know, like I was saying with the job example, if they were like, hey, we hired you to do mailroom, but do you want to, do you like run the company? <laughs> That'd be great. We're a Fortune 500. Do you, would you like to run it? You'd be like, something's weird here. And you don't have to know what that is. You don't have to, you aren't supposed to know at that point. Your intuition is just giving you that noodles growling at the hedge moment where you're like, I'm just going to listen. And I don't need to know. I don't need to tell you or justify. And this is the patriarchy oppressing us that like, well, if a woman wants to listen to her intuition, she better have some fucking good reasons for it. Otherwise she's not allowed to get out of here. I can do whatever I want. And I make decisions all the time based on intuition that might seem crazy to people, but I don't care. One time I didn't get on a plane because I just had a really really bad feeling. And it was so strong. It was like, don't get on that plane. And I'm not afraid to fly. I fly all the time. I, I like it. And the plane didn't blow up. It was fine. But I could have found trouble on that plane. Maybe it would have spilled a beer all over me. Maybe some guy would have groped me. Maybe it would have gotten stuck in a place I didn't want to be. 
You never know and you don't have to know. I have stopped requiring that of my intuition. I just listen now. I let her shoot first and I'll ask questions later. Because if I look back a lot of times, especially with love, it's like, yeah, I might not have known why something inside me was saying like, "Mm -mm, no, but something was. There's this book called The Gift of Fear. I highly encourage you guys to read it. And it's about how we need to listen to our intuition, namely our fear responses to keep us safe. And it's like the fact that we even have to write a book saying, if you're afraid, you should listen to it. But here's where we are in society because we have been oppressed. And the things that stood out is when this girl, she was, she was coming into her apartment building, like carrying groceries, like probably somewhere. And this guy came through the door after her, you know, she like, she, he followed her into the building and was nice. He's like, Oh, I'll hold the door for you. Whatever it was. He ended up kidnapping her and locking her a box for like four years, like so, something ghastly. And she was going through it with a therapist to try to work through it. And she's like, you know, when I, when I heard him talk, I didn't like his voice. I didn't like his voice. And, but I told myself, that's crazy. Shut up. Stop be, don't be rude because society tells us the worst thing a woman can be is rude. That's right up there with crazy and uppity. But what the therapist got her to realize is that she didn't hear the door open behind her. He didn't actually follow her and he was already in the building and her intuition saying, I don't like his voice knew that her intuition made those billions of micro calculations instantly. And had she listened to that, she would have been more caught. She made it turn around. She could have run. It might not have gone that way. I mean, it gives me chills even thinking about it. But when we trace things back, it's really important to look at like, well, what was actually going on there? What was, and that will make us so much smarter going forward. What's actually going on here? What am I feeling? And what is someone telling me not to feel? What are they telling me to oppress? Are they calling me impolite, crazy, ungrateful? If that's the case, the intuition is not the problem. They are. This voice inside us exists to keep us alive and keep us safe for tens of thousands of years. And one fuck boy doesn't know better than your DNA. For more, tell me what you want to hear about. Click like and subscribe for new videos every day and follow me on Instagram at ShallonXO. And what do you think about Jake and Tomato? To turpentine, whatever. I just, I don't even care anymore. Those two. What do you think about those two? Do you think that they're actually like fun and cool? Or are you like, yeah, no, you can find those people at any gas station in South Florida. Let me know. I want to talk about it. And like I said, if you want to connect privately, find me on the Instant Go app at Shadow and XO and listen to my podcast, Girl on Top. Bye.